My name is Kirk Boyle, and I'm a doctoral candidate uh, in the English department here at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, the person to my left is uh, Stanley Corkin, a uh, professor in the English department, uh, who just so happens to be ever so patiently uh, working with me on my dissertation. Today I'm here to ask him a few questions about his new book, Starring New York as Itself, Film, Globalization, and Cultural Narratives of Decline and Rebirth, 1969 to 1980. In an overview uh, for the book you are currently working on, starring New York as itself, film, globalization, and cultural narratives of decline and rebirth, 1969 to 1980, you make clear that it is not a study of film history so how would you define the project? It, though it, it does have you know, some film history in it. I mean, the germ of the project is, you know, is, uh, emerges from the fact that there are really a lot of, uh, of productions that employ new, uh, location shoots in New York as their, as their center but in that period. And then before, not so much, actually very little, because location shooting was so difficult, both because of because of logistics substantially, one because of the difficulty of getting permits in New York before the Lindsay administration, and two because the equipment didn't wasn't friendly to location shoots. And then by the late 60s, uh, equipment becomes much more mobile, and so that's part of it. So that is you know that those pieces really are film history. If there wasn't this concentration of films shot in New York, you know there'd be no book. I'd be doing something else. But uh, it isn't a conventional film history because I'm not, you know, that, that's kind of a backdrop, the fact of, uh, of what allows uh, this kind of, this concentration of production. Really, I'm interested in these films as they open out into a larger historical narrative, and that's been true of my work all along. I think that uh, commercial films are important nexi of relationships between text and context, between uh, between uh, the film itself and in an audience. So that uh, I would say this is a film about, uh, this is a film, this is a book about film and history and you know really more broadly about the relationships between mass culture and works of the imagination. In Cowboys as Cold Warriors you studied uh, 16 films uh, between the years 1946 and 1962 uh, Star in New York as itself takes a look at a group of films that begin to appear almost a decade later. So my question is, uh, uh, why skip the 60s? More broadly, why New York? Why this group of films? I mean, I don't really skip the 60s, you know, because uh, the last chapter of the Western's book is 1962, and it's really a considered discussion of 1962. I think that's the title of the chapter. And it's th about three films from 1962. I pick up this book in 1969, clearly with a different focus. But uh, the first film I talk about is Midnight Cowboy, which is you know really part of a group of films that change the industry and uh, that really have the mark of the counterculture on them. The, uh, the next film I think I deal with chronologically is Clute, which is you know stars Jane Fonda and is also something of a you know counterculture film. The reason, you know, part of the reason I don't deal with that film, with that period from 1962 to 1967 is one that has been studied a lot, you know, in, in all manners of history, including film history, but also because I didn't generate the question that that would answer. And what I tend to do in developing these projects is I look at uh, concentrations, you know, visible concentrations of a type of film within a uh, discrete chronology. It seems to me that this shift from studying genre, westerns, to studying place, New York City, is indicative of a shift in methodology. In your current work, you seem to be just as interested in studying space as you do time. Is this a correct assessment? And if so, um, what has uh, drawn you to the discipline of geography? I realized after I wrote my westerns book that it would have been much better if I had known more about geography. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I subsequently read uh, Neil Smith's uh, 
history of American diplomacy in the 20th century. And I realized that the frontier, you know, I had been kind of working around the idea of geography all through the Western book, and there were, and I kind of accidentally backed into it a lot of times, but I didn't explicitly explore it in the, uh, so that one of the things I saw, you know, after having done that reading, one of the things I saw is that, uh, you know, the conceptual uh, definitions of geography are fundamental to the way in which we think about the world and we think about relationships. And that became a key question of the New York book is, you know, how do you see New York as close to London and, uh, you know, far from uh, uh, the outlying areas of the Bronx, right? I mean, you know, the, the relationship between, the physical relationship between, you know, the financial centers of Manhattan and the despair of the South Bronx in the, late, in the 70s and 80s is only about four or five miles. Yet those, you know, you may, you would have, uh, for the traders working in down, downtown on Wall Street, uh, they would have much more relationship, both social and business, with traders in London than they would with people who uh, live four and five miles away. So that, you know, you can see that relational space is relative and you really need a way of understanding uh, a working map that accounts for uh, the concept of geography, the conceptual geography, cultural geography, really. Well, thank you, Stan. Thank you, Kirk. Always a pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks.